This is Anna Akhmatova, Russian poet and legitimate badass. You may not have heard of her before, but in her lifetime, Akhmatova was so famous and so popular that her second collection of poetry, Rosary, uh, was the subject of a popular after-dinner game in which people would sit around the dinner table and recite the poems line by line until they'd completed the entire collection from memory. And if that doesn't sell you, she also lived one hell of a life. Anna Akhmatova was born near Odessa in 1889, the third child in an upper-class family. They were a naval family and relocated to St. Petersburg in her early life, but Anna still spent most of her childhood summers on the sea in Sebastopol. This period inspired her collection by the seashore. Bays broke the low shore, boats ran out to sea, and I dry my salty hair on a flat rock a mile from land, swam to me the green fish flew to me the white seagull. I was gay and bold and wicked, and never knew I was happy. She discovered poetry at 11 years old, and saw her first publication at 17. She then married a fellow poet in 1910, and two years later, her son Lev was born. By this point, Anna had become part of a group of poets that included Ossip Mandelstam, and with whom she founded the Guild of Poets. Their anti-symbolist view of poetry, with a focus on concise language and clear images, would come to be known as Acmeism. The group gathered in the Stray Dog Cafe in St. Petersburg, which was a smoky, raucous cabaret joint, home to the most influential artists and thinkers in Russia. These were happy and productive years. Akhmatova published her first collection in 1912, and by 1917 had published two more, including the aforementioned Rosary, which made her a household name in Russia. Soon, however, a little event you might have heard of called the February Revolution occurred, uh, and that was in 1917, and with it came an end to an almost unbelievable period of creativity in Russian poetry. This period would later be known as the Silver Age, and Akhmatova, along with Mandelstam, Boris Pasternak from Dr. Zhivago fame, and the poet Marina Sveteva would be at its forefront. So, the Russian Revolution starts, and with it, Anna's life goes from fairly normal to literally the reason that I'm making this video. See, Akhmatova wasn't just an incredible writer. She lived a life worth writing about. A life of almost absurd hardships. Akhmatova divorced her husband in 1918. He was taken by Lenin's agents in 1921 and executed as an anti-Bolshevik. The new Marxist government didn't take kindly to the intelligista and viewed them as bourgeois. Their lives from then on would forever be in danger. Terror fingers all things in the dark, leads moonlight to the axe. There's an ominous knock behind the wall. A ghost, a thief, or a rat. Akhmatova wasn't able to publish another volume of poetry for almost 20 years. The authorities placed an unofficial ban on her work due to her friendships and connections and constantly arrested those with whom she associated. She was in effect treated as an enemy of the state. At this point, her poetry changed from mainly introspective musings to larger reflections on the state of her country. Akhmatova was intensely patriotic and she decided that rather than to flee her country like other poets had done, that she would stay, even though it meant risking her life and her entire future, in order to document the hardships and suffering that she saw. I'm not one of those who left their country for wolves to tear it limb from limb. Their flattery does not touch me. I will not give my songs to them. She remarried, this time to a scholar, and lived in previously royal accommodation that had been nationalised by the Bolsheviks. They lived on little food and without heating through the long Russian winters. Anna's only source of income was from the odd translating job she managed to secure through friends. Her name dropped out of Soviet publication and the state moved on, trying to erase those it didn't like. In the mid-1920s, she divorced again and moved to live with her friend, the poet Punin. There were many families in the home and Akhmatova lived among constant noise and squalor. The blight against her name was stronger than ever, and she struggled to even place her son in education. The revolutionary leader Lenin died around this time, and leadership eventually passed to this objectively terrible bastard that you might recognize. 
As the 1930s got underway, so did the Stalinist purges, and so did what would be the hardest time of Akhmatova's life. Akhmatova was now officially banned from publication, and her home was under the constant threat of being searched. If they found her writing, it could be used as evidence against her, and she could be executed. However, she continued to write, committing her work to memory. She would often write on scraps of cigarette paper, repeat the lines to her closest friends so they could remember it too, and then burn the paper. The state began to execute poets and intellectuals more frequently, and Anna's friends were often the victims. Mandelstam was arrested repeatedly, and eventually sent to the Gulag, where in 1938, he died of starvation. Marina Sveteva was sent into exile, and took her own life in 1941. It seems inconceivable to think of someone being killed for poetry these days, but as Mandelstam himself once quoted, only in Russia is poetry respected. It gets people killed. Is there anywhere else where poetry is so common a motive for murder? Anna's son Lev was arrested again and again, and from 1935 to 1956, he spent most of his life in and out of prisons and forced labor camps. Being the son of his parents was his only crime. In those years, Akhmatova was in desperate poverty. It's said that all she owned was a coat, a hat, and a broken suitcase. But her dedication to her son was so great that at one point when he was being held inside Leningrad prison, she went daily for 17 months straight to wait outside the prison walls in the long queues of wives and daughters and mothers who were all hoping for news of their loved one's well-being. On one of these days, Anna was recognized by a starving young woman in the line. She whispered to her through half-frozen lips, can you describe this? Determined to give voice to the suffering these women endured, Akhmatova composed her masterpiece, Requiem. It is a poem of many fragmented parts, with a prologue and an epilogue, full of religious imagery mixed with raw descriptions of the horrendous experiences they were all going through. They took you away at daybreak. Half waking as though at awake, I followed. In the dark chamber, children were crying. In the image case, candlelight gutted. At your lips, the chill of an icon. A deathly sweat at your brow. I shall go creep to our wailing wall. Crawl to the Kremlin Towers. In its epilogue, Anna writes of her pain at trying to tell the story of so many tortured people. Again, the hands of the clock are nearing the unforgettable hour. I see, hear, touch all of you. The cripple they had to support painfully to the end of the line. The moribund. And the girl who would shake her beautiful head and say, I come here as if it were my home. I shall like to call you all by name, but they have lost the lists. I have woven for them a great shroud out of the poor words I overheard them speak. I remember them always and everywhere, and if they shut my tormented mouth through which a hundred million of my people cry, let them remember me also." The Second World War had spread throughout Europe by 1940, and Anna witnessed the 900-day siege of Leningrad. In an unexplainable twist of fate, Stalin ordered the evacuation of important artists to Tashkent in Uzbekistan in 1942, and Anna lived there for two years. Some of her poems were briefly published again at this point, but this was to be short-lived. She returned to Russia, and in 1946 was denounced by the government and again banned from publication. This time, her work permits were also seized. If it wasn't for the charity of her friends and admirers, she would almost certainly have perished. From 1940, she had begun writing her longest and most complex work, Palm Without a Hero, and continued to rework it for the next 20 years. It's set in 1913, and dedicated to her friends and colleagues, all dead by then, as well as the memory of her carefree, youthful days in the Stray Dog Cafe in St. Petersburg. Anna's health began to decline in the late 1940s. In 1953, Stalin died suddenly, and shortly afterwards, the thaw began. In 1956, Akhmatova's work was finally published again, although with heavy editing and censorship, and later the same year, her son Lev was permanently released from imprisonment. Anna continued to work on Palm Without a Hero, and outside of Russia, her profile began to grow once again. 
Requiem was published abroad, where she was beginning to be seen as a great dissident poet, and slowly, as the voice of the Russian people. She was eventually allowed to leave the country, and in the mid-1960s, travelled abroad. She was deep into her 70s by then. She travelled to Italy to receive a literary prize, and then to England, where she was given an honorary doctorate by Oxford University. Shortly after this trip, she suffered a heart attack, from which she would never recover, and died in the autumn of 1966. She was 76 years old, and the last of the Silver Age poets. So, why should you read Anna Akhmatova? If it isn't clear yet, uh, it's because she is incredible. Her writing is both intensely personal and passionate, but it's also a document of a time and of experiences that without her would have just been lost to history. The risks she took to record it all are almost unbelievable by our standards, but she did it anyway and she did it beautifully. I want to leave you with something that she wrote in 1963, three years before her death. You will hear thunder and remember me and think she wanted storms. The rim of the sky will be the color of hard crimson and your heart as it was then will be on fire. That day in Moscow, it will all come true when for the last time I take my leave and hasten to the heights that I have longed for, leaving my shadow still to be with you. All right, so that is it for this week. Uh, thank you for watching. If you've enjoyed this video, check out others. There's plenty of them. Um, and also subscribe to the channel. Let me know you like it and I plan on doing a lot more. If there are any particular writers or poets or artists you want to see these sort of deep dives on, let me know that as well. Until then, have a good week slash fortnight. Uh, sorry for the lighting and I'll see you later.